Muito obrigado. Uma problema. I had to eat five more cruzidos to fit into this. Is that, is that what's going to happen? Okay. All right, well, thank you all for coming. It's, it's uh, uh, a huge honor to be doing this. And to be perfectly honest, I, I certainly have done lots of cooking demos. Um, and I love doing it because you actually, as opposed to cameras, cameras don't laugh back, right? Cameras are very cold. People, however, if it's funny, will laugh back. And I much prefer doing demos like this in front of people. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, this is the first time that I'm doing it as a state chef as we've been anointed. Uh, it's a brand new thing that the State Department just started and absolutely humbled and honored to be rep representing the United States uh, and equally honored to be here in this school uh, in, in Sao Miguel uh, uh, in the Azores. It's a fantastic place and I hope all of you that live here realize how beautiful and how lucky you are to be living here and to be Azorian because it really is a very special place and as I just said in an interview, Lots of countries have great food, lots of countries have beauty and green and sea, but ultimately it's about the people. And, and every person I've met, and specifically I've been you know, with, with Philippe, cooking with Chef Hugo, cooking with Chef Pedro, uh, it's been just a fantastic learning experience, but also very fun for me. I mean, as all you, uh, especially all you guys that are cooking, you realize the most important thing is to taste, 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 but not taste your own food, it's to taste someone else's food, because hopefully I will be better tomorrow as a chef that I was today, right? And while we're doing this demo, as you can tell, I'm very casual, uh, and you can hear me, and without a microphone, please feel free to, um, to ask any questions. I prefer English. Fala pouquinho português, pouquinho, like that. Um, so I can say cozida, I can say alacantra, I can say uh, tessiera, vino, blanco, tinto, that's about it. So, um, so English, I'm, I'm very good at English, so please. All right. So, uh, the dish I want to make you, and I'm sorry you can't see, there's no mirror here, but this is, uh, uh, this is plastic. <laughs> Plas plastico, right? Uh, amberjack, right? Beautiful fish, your fish, obviously. Um, beautiful, f and, and by the way, just in case you don't, when you smell fish, it should smell like the sea, right? It should never smell fishy. If it smells fishy, return it. Don't ever buy it. It's got to smell fresh like to see. Uh, this fish is delicious sashimi, right? Hamachi, delicious all by itself. Uh, and just cut it like that and eat it, perfect. Um, but I'm gonna do a technique that um, I certainly did not invent. The Chinese invented it probably 2,000 years ago. Uh, it's called tea smoking. And uh, fortunately I was at this place with Mad Madeleine, who's the fourth generation uh, tea grower here, uh, here in the Azores and she gave us a great tour and by going there two days ago it influenced me once I saw this fish to cook with that let's do a tea smoking technique so I'm going to show you that real quickly so to do tea smoking you take tea and it's equal parts right so equal parts tea by volume and this is this is what's called the broken leaf right so tea dried rice long grain rice so one to one to one all right and sugar, azúcar? Azu okay, sure, sucre. <laughs> sucre? See, it's, the Portuguese is so much closer to French than Spanish, actually, right? Because in French, I speak fluent French, so I'll just speak French, might be easier. The sucre. And then I love it, if you just add a oish at the end, you're speaking Portuguese, right? So you speak Spanish, like for example, muito, oh, let's see. Um, Queixo, yeah, queixo, queso, queixo. You know, bonjour, bonjour. No, that doesn't work. All right, so, equal parts, all right? Just mix that up. And then what we're gonna do is here we have, um, and this is on hot, all right? So all we have is foil, and the only reason we do that is because it protects the pan so it doesn't get so dirty. So the idea of this tea smoking is you have the tea, which of course will give a fantastic fragrance when it starts to smolder. But the sugar, once it hits heat, starts to melt and caramelize. 
So that smoldering sugar starts to make the tea smoke. And you need rice as the insulator. If you don't have the rice, the sugar will burn and turn ne negro, negrosh. No, does it work? Pronto, okay. Well, it's starting to turn black and they'll get bitter. So you have to have the rice. All right, so this all gets poured into the pan. And you spread this out. And you can't really see this very well, but you'll, you'll start to see it smoke within, within probably two minutes, dos minutos. All right, so we have the agua. So right here, so I'll just put this over here for a sec. So what, what uh, Chef Hugo did for me is he took the beautiful hamachi, the amberjack, and he kind of brined it. So like when you make gravlax, right? It's a salt, sugar, and spices, all right? So this has a ton of salt and sugar on it. And we did this today, so it's been what? I don't know, six hours, maybe? And obviously that's a lot, so you actually have to rinse it to take off the salt sugar. So that cures it a little bit, right? So you actually could just slice and eat this right now. It'd be delicious. But I wanna dry it off. All right. Put that there. Have another, actually this is good. Is there another towel? Uh, ah, yes. You had this in the kitchen, I'm like, oh my God, look at that toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> All right. Techniques, is this starting to smoke yet? Yeah, uh, you'll see it a little bit. This will start to smoke. All right, so we'll do this. I'm running out of room here. All right, so we'll take the second one here. See, over the other We do over the other And if you can tell, it's actually a little stiffer, right? Uh, that's the cure, right? Salt cooks. So it actually's cured a little bit. So we'll take this. You're, you're gonna start to smell the tea in a little bit. I can smell it right here. You see how stiff that is? It's much stiffer than when raw. Here's more. Put this here. And dry that off. So I don't need to season this anymore. All right. So. All right, so that's going to take a couple more minutes, all right? So, yeah, minute. So what we're going to do, as soon as, as soon as that starts to smoke, we're going to lay it on top, and you really want to do it for about 20 minutes or so of the smoke to really get a nice smokiness. But we also got, we stopped, actually, uh, Philippe stopped when we were um, by the um, cal cal calderas, by the calderas, and you know about the corn, right, that you cook, which is delicious, right, it's really sweet. Um, it's fully cooked, but today when I cooked in the kitchen uh, with Chef Hugo, we actually tea smoked this a little bit too, and we ended up making a corn salad with my all new favorite condiment in the world, right, your pimente de te terra, it's so good. Right, in China, in China, we have something called la jiao, which is uh, sambal olek in Indonesia, right? It's a, it's a spicy chili paste. So yours is a little less spicy, but that's okay, and salty. But once you try it, it's like, oh, it's fantastic. So if you use this, you don't really need to, need to add salt. So I'm gonna make a corn salad using this, but I don't need salt, because I have this, and it's, it's awesome. And you also have something here. Limon, oh, shoot. <laughs> Lima Galeo? Galejo? I thought it was Limo. No? Galejo? Galejo. That's what I said. Galejo. <laughs> In Japanese, it's called yuzu. Right? It's really the best citrus flavor, I think, in the world. Uh, and if you've not made, maybe uh, Joao back there will make a cock. Where's Joao? He was here. But he's a great mixologist. Have you, but you can make the best yuzu martini in the world using this, right? It is a pain in the derriere because you've got to juice like 20 of them to make one drink. But God, it's so good. So you guys see this a little bit? So you, you can start to, start to smell it. I, um, I really don't, I can't really show you, right? Although I can do it really quickly. Quick, I, see that? 
See, it's starting to caramelize a little bit. All right, don't touch. All right, so it's starting to mix a little bit, but more importantly, you can smell it, right? So I'm gonna wait till you see a good amount of smoke, and then I'm gonna put it on the hamachi on, the amberjack. So I'm gonna lay these two fillets on top. I'm gonna take this uh, maíz in Spanish. Portuguese? Oh, so much of my theory. What is it? Milio? God, that's not like French or Spanish. All right. Laurimi in Chinese. So I'm just gonna lay those in there. So as soon as you get enough, it's starting to smoke like that, we can just lay it across and we have a little extra foil. We have to cover it. Hello. Is it foil actually? Yeah, too many, too many secret doors you go. Uh, you guys ever see Iron Chef? You get that on TV here? Ah, nobody got Okay, so see that smoke? That looks good to me. So I'm gonna put this on top, all right? I'm gonna take some foil. All right, and seal it. You really have to seal it tight because you really want this fish to smoke. All right? So, normally I would let it smoke for five to eight minutes and then turn it off and let it continue to smoke for 20 to 25 total. All right? And this, this could be for anything. Yeah, it's fantastic for fish, but you can take you know, beef tenderloin, you can take pork, you can take anything in its raw state, smoke it, and then just store it away. And then when you cook it, if you sear, you know, sear a nice pork chop or sear a steak, it'll be muito sabrosa because you'll have the smoky flavor, uh, but then you can still cook it rare or medium rare, however you want, All right? So as that's going, I really don't have another burner, do I? So you, I'm gonna take this, you take this in the back, can you smoke it, and then I can make the vinaigrette? Okay, obrigado. All right, so I'm going to make a, um, uh, and by the way, my show called Simply Ming, we do something cooking on the fly. And what that really means is exactly how I cook and most chefs cook at home. We go to a market, outdoor market or a beautiful store, and we see what looks good. Right? I don't say I need to make asparagus soup. No, I go to the market, see what looks best, what looks right, what, looks, what smells good, uh, what may be cheaper. I mean, if they have a special on chicken legs, I might go there instead of beef. You know, I'm Chinese, right? We're very cheap. So, no, no, that's, that's a true story. And, um, um, but just like, just like my father used to, he used to open the fridge, and like an Iron Chef, within five minutes, we have a fried rice or a chow mein, a fried noodle dish. So that's how I cook at home. And that's, so the show Simply Ming on the fly does the same thing. So today, for example, with both Chef Pedro and Chef Hugo, we went to the market, we saw what was available, and based on what I saw, it inspired me, plus seeing the Azorian influence, you know, this pimante, right? Seeing what flavor is really predominant here, I bring it into my own cuisine with a little Asian influence. I mean, I really, I really don't go anywhere without soy sauce, right? It's like, it's like your salt, right? So I have soy sauce. Um, but by, by seeing, and then again, by going to the, uh, by going to the tea place, um, by smelling the tea and drinking the tea, that really inspired me. I want to cook with this tea. And, and then once, um, once Chef Hugo showed me he had hamachi, he had amberjack, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna bring this tea into this dish, all right? So, and, and then he had a whole bunch of different vegetables. I love poirot, right? I love leeks. So I figured, well, why don't we do kind of a tea smoked hamachi? And we created this today, by the way. This is not something that I wrote weeks ago. It was just today, we looked at it and decided to cook. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna make a bird noisette. So this is butter, and by the way, like I said earlier, you guys have the best butter and cheese here, right? So this is a very hot pan, which is what I want. So bird noisette, you guys all know? I mean, this pan is super hot, and I want to actually not burn the butter, but I want to get it noisette, noisette. I want to darken the butter. So I want to get it to brown. And then that's gonna be my fat to make a vinaigrette. So as opposed to using oil, you know, olive oil or canola oil, whatever oil is your fat, I'm going to use butter as my fat. And that's what's going to go on top of my dish. All right? So, I know you can hear it, 
Um, and there's very few, very few things that smell as good as Bernoisette, noisette, right? I mean, it's such a wonderful flavor. So as, um, as soon as this gets brown, is then when I'm gonna add some leeks, I'm gonna add a little bit of minced garlic, and then my acid is gonna come from the yuzu. And by the way, this, and I'm sure, I'm sure the chefs teach you this, roll your citrus, right? Roll your citrus, you wanna break it down so you can get as much citrus out of it, all right? That's important. All right, is there any questions so far? Anyone? Sorry, so the corn... Sorry, why sorry? I forgot if you said that you actually cured or put anything on the corn. The corn, the corn I bought on the street that was, that was boiled in the water at the Calderas? Calderas, okay. right? And really, and inexpensive, I can't, I don't even remember. It's, I think, I don't need 50 cents maybe a piece. So it's already, so it's already cooked corn. Um, but the tea smoking, uh, and it's a great question because that tea smoke is not hot, right? It's not 200 degrees Fahrenheit, right? It's not, it's not even close to 100 centigrade. So it's not really going to cook, per se, the corn. And the hamachi is not going to cook all the way through, which is why I cured it like Groblox. So again, I could have sliced that hamachi and just eat it like that, straight up. Um, and you can do nothing to hamachi and eat it straight up because it's such a fantastic fish. So the smoke is just to get a little bit of smokiness flavor into the corn. So let me show you. So at this moment, it's, uh, I'll do it quickly. So it's kind of yellow, right? So it's not, it's not brown yet. So I really want to go, if you guys see that back there. So I'm going to really go so it's brown, all right? Because when, when butter turns brown, it just, just tastes so much better, right? It really does. And you'll have, you'll have a little sediment. This, this, of course, you know when you make clarified butters, you boil a whole bunch and then the sediment settles and you have the beautiful clarified. But here I'm going to use the solids because the solids actually have flavor as well, right? So it's already browning a little bit more. You'll see. So it's already a little bit browner, right? So we'll keep going. Again, I want to get it nice and brown. All right. So this, we'll just cut these in half. And obviously, we don't want the seeds. So when you juice, either juice into a strainer or juice in your hands. I have clean, muito limpio. Okay. So here, now you can see. See that? That's where it was at, right there. All right. So at this moment, I'm going to take some leeks. Let that cook. All right. Take some garlic. All right. Nice tablespoon. Let that cook. All right. I don't need much salt because I know that there's going to be the, the pimenti de terra, which is salty. That's going to go in the corn, and this is a vinaigrette. But you always need a little bit. And black pepper. Any other questions out there? Really? Okay. Obrigado. That's okay. We'll get you. So I can show you a little bit. So it's kind of, it's just starting to wilt a little bit, right? You just, you're trying to, you just want to get it nice and soft. All right? You can see, you can see how nice and dark that is? All right? It smells good, right? Is it, I mean, onions, cebollas, anything, garlic, this is the best. So you do want to cook this till it gets soft, and then all I'm going to do is add the acid. Um, you have the hamachi, like we have this hamachi here, fully cooked, right? Because that's going to take a while. Um, bring me the corn back, though, if you could. The corn? No, it's in the smoker. See, si. obrigado. He was great. He made a fantastic dish. Hopefully, you get to see this show. But he made this polenta cake with the hamachi, and um, it was a sweet, uh, sweet and sour sauce. I can't remember what he called it. It's a traditional. He said his father was going to kill him because it's a, tra it's a traditional dish that he modernized and, and with, with the corn. When I ate it, I'm like, that's delicious. All right, so this is nice, nice and soft. So now I'm gonna take the yuzu. I'm gonna go ahead and juice a little bit more here. So again, obviously you don't want any seeds in it. Now I'll save a little bit fresh. There's nothing better than fresh citrus on top, right? So now this I can add the yuzu straight in. All right, 
And now this I can actually turn off. Now, there's, if there's anything you learn from me today, the most important thing, taste, 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 right? I've done this a lot, this actual vinaigrette, but I've not done it today in the Azores, right? So you have to taste it. Hey, it's pretty good. Here's this. I'm asked all the time when I do my TV shows, because if you've not seen it before, I taste all the time. I say, oh, this is really good. It's good to plate. Let's plate it up, and I'll plate it up. So people ask me, say, Chef, what would you say if you made a dish, nobody go, what would you say if you made a dish and you're plating it up and it didn't taste good? I'm like, well, that's easy. I would look right in the camera with a big smile. I would lie and say, muito sabrosa. You can't be like, oh, disgusting. Go buy my book. That doesn't work. I always smile. You say it with conviction. People believe you, right? All right. So, so, I don't know if you can see this now. So now you got this kind of warm vinaigrette that is, that is that it's a, as we say, broken vinaigrette, but I'm not trying to emulsify. I'm never gonna put this into a blender to emulsify, right? I, I want to see the butter separate from the yuzu, because really, at the end of the day, it's about the leeks and the garlic, all right? So, the good news about these burners is they get really hot. The bad news about these burners is they never cool off. I mean, this will be cold manana, manana. So I don't want it to overreduce. All right, so here we have the corn. And here, take this, just pass this around. This is only, just go ahead and smell and just pass it around. This is what, five minutes? But you can smell the tea smoke already. Um, just five minutes. And you can not only just smell smoke, you can tell it's tea. And you can tell it's this tea. And it's very flowery, which I love. So what we're gonna do now, is we're gonna make this corn salad. So I'm just gonna take the corn off the cob, right? And I like it. When they're in pieces like this, I think that's awesome, right? That looks so cool. All right. A couple of these. Right, this smells pretty good, right? You're welcome to take a bite and just keep passing it around. I feel bad for the last person. This, all right, so this will take, just lay into a bowl, and I'm really not gonna add much to this at all. Again, no salt, because this is salty. We're gonna add a little bit of this. Chef, uh, I have just a, a shy girl in here that wants to make you a connection. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Can she interrupt you? No, no. When, when did she decide to become a chef? When did I decide to become a chef? Uh, great question. Uh, a long time ago. I could be your grandfather, I think. I'm Chinese, I'm 102, I know. <laughs> Pretty good, I know, lots of vino tinto. Lots of soy sauce and vino tinto, it's amazing. Um, I'll tell you, true story. And I say this all the time. I was, still am, and will always be hungry. That's why I'm a chef. So literally, when I was two and three years old, I would be in the kitchen. Because I knew if I hung out in the kitchen, my grandparents and my parents would throw me scraps, right? It could be a piece of duck, it could be a piece of chicken, it could be a dim sum, a pot stick or something. And by hanging out in the kitchen, I saw the coolest things in the world. I saw stuff with fire turned into fried rice. I saw this and that, and, and uh, just amazed. So when I was six years old, we have, you know, Duncan Hines cake mix, right? You probably have Duncan Hines or something like it. It was a cake mix. So all my friends would be out playing baseball and football, and I'd be baking cakes, right? And they'd be like, okay, sure. <laughs> you know? I don't want to say it because, you know, we're here with the embassy. But, um, but they would always make fun of me. That, oh, look at Ming. Ming's making cakes, and, you know, they're out playing sports. But then, of course, once the sports were done, they'd be like, is that cake? I'm like, yeah, yeah, one dollar. So, fast forward to age 10. When I turned 10 years old, uh, in Chinese culture, when you see someone on the street, a friend or family member, you actually say, Shurlama, which is, have you eaten? Not how are you, not hola, ketal, or, uh, 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 not ketal, como estas, yes. 
No, have you eaten? Because it gives me an opportunity to eat with you if you haven't. So, true story, I'm in Dayton, Ohio, where I lived, my parents were not home, ding dong, I see Uncle and Auntie at the doorstep, and everyone that was older, the friends of my parents were Uncle and Auntie. I mean, there were, they were two, two Caucasians, they're not blood, but they're like, I recognize them. So the first thing I said is, have you eaten? And they said, no, we're starved. I'm like, okay, come in, come in, let me make you fried rice. That's all fine and dandy, but I'm 10, and I've never made fried rice before. But I've seen my parents and grandparents make it 100 times. So I'm like, no problem. I, can, I, I actually could do a, I had good knife skills because I used to sharpen cleavers with my grandfather. So I actually knew how to cut. So every good Chinese household has leftover rice in the fridge. So I scrambled eggs first, and then I cut the garlic and the ginger and the scallions, I made egg fried rice. To be honest, it was about a five or six out of 10 quality. It was a little bit too greasy and a little bit too much soy sauce because I panicked. But all that mattered to the two people eating it, and the only thing that mattered to me, is they started to smile. And I actually thought to myself, you can make people happy through food? That's amazing. I'm gonna do this for a living. So that's how I started cooking. Now, I didn't start cooking professionally until 15, because my mom owned a Chinese restaurant. So age uh, 14 and a half, 15, 16, 17, 18, I was you know, the chef, I was a cook, I was a rice maker, I was a janitor, I was a dishwasher. But I really fell in love, and as we say, we got the bug, the restaurant bug, which is the service industry, which is if you, you, know, if you make good food at a reasonable price, you can make people happy. It's one of the coolest jobs in the world. And I say this all the time, it's instant gratification every night at Blue Ginger. Every night I go home, I see plates coming back empty or plates coming back full of food. Normally, 99% of the time, they're empty and people leave smiling. Instant gratification. Unlike most jobs, even musicians and artists, they may not see that painting for 100 years or 50 years or two years. When you cook, you get it back immediately. And, and that is really why I'm a chef. I, I, I get that instant gratification um, of knowing that I could change someone for those two hours and make them happy. And then all you in white coats, I hope that's how you think. Uh, and one thing I always tell people, which is so important, is don't, don't ever cook because you want to be famous. And actually don't cook because you want to be successful. Success will come to you if you just want to make good food. If you make good food and that's your only goal, everything else will just fall into place. But if you try to cook to be famous or successful and be rich, it'll never work. Because you're putting too much pressure on yourself. Just cook to make it taste good. And everything else will follow. Uh, and believe in yourself. You, and you, you have to, you have to take risks. You can't just make, you know, cheese sandwich. Right? That's not going to do much. You got to do something different, right? Put corn in it or put some of the pimante or whatever, but take a risk. But taste, taste, taste to make sure it tastes good. And believe you me, you're going to have some failures. You're going to have something that doesn't taste good, but as long as you're tasting it yourself before you serve it to someone, you don't actually serve it. So it's so important to taste. And you'll, and you'll see me all night long. And th this literally has three ingredients, right? It has the pimante, it has the corn, and I'm going to put just a little bit of the yuzu. Just a touch. Delicious. <laughs> See? All right. Um, oh, I have this hamachi here. Okay. Let me take this out here. All right. So, any other questions? Sir. Yeah, great question. Really great question. I've been, I've been at Blue Junior 14 years. We've owned it for 14 years, my wife and I. And all my friends in the States, I don't know if you've heard, Emeril Lugasi, actually, who was born um, uh, close to the tea plantation, right? Um, he's got 15 or 20 restaurants, Mario Batali, all these guys, Bobby Flay, they all have all these restaurants. Two reasons. The, the, the major reason is quality. But there's two qualities. Quality of product, because I want to make sure no one ever says that Ming Tsai used to be a great chef. That would kill me, right? So quality of product and quality of life. I I'm here one time. This is not a dress rehearsal. You get one big wave, one tsunami in life. It's not like, okay, that's okay, I'll do it again. No, you get one chance, guys. 
And, and I have two children that are 12 and 10 now, two boys that are awesome. And I have one wife, awesome. And I want to keep that. I want to keep all of that. And quality of life for me is being able to, to go on vacation with them when I, when I want to. And, and being able to do something like this and come to the Azores and play golf when I want to. And the problem when you get so many restaurants is usually the quality of the restaurants go down. Uh, and more important, the quality of your life goes down because you end up stressing about all your restaurants. Now, having said all of that, I did announce just last month I am going to open a second one. First time though in 14 years. But it's going to be a very casual. My current restaurant's called Blue Ginger. My next one's called Blue Dragon. And if you know this, right now is Year of the Dragon. Is anyone here a dragon? Do you know? Anyone here born in 1964? 76? 88? 2000? 2012? <laughs> All right, so 2012 is Year of the Dragon. There are five elements in Chinese folklore, right? Water, fire, earth, metal. Right now is water. So it's Year of the Water Dragon. Happens once every 60 years. I will not be around 60 years from now, unfortunately, even though if I keep drinking wine, I probably won't be around 60 years. You will be around 60 years, most of you, sorry. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, these work, you know. Um, so this is the only time that the year of the water dragon is gonna go by my life. So hence the name Blue Dragon. So I have to open the restaurant by February 10th, because in February 10th, it changes over from dragon to rat, I think. And you can't name a restaurant Blue Rat. It'd be, I don't think that'd be a very successful restaurant. Um, and Blue Dragon is going to be a much more casual restaurant. It's going to be an Asian gastro pub, right? So in, in New York, London, Dublin, all these gastro pubs, which are not a pub with really good food. But I'm going to put an Asian spin on it. It's only 80 seats. My current restaurants, all in with everything, is about 200 plus. It's 7,000 square feet. It's very large. And that's like the size of a Tissiera. No, it's not. Um, and casual food, meaning once it's up and running, and I have a great chef that's going to run it, and I have a great manager that's going to run the front, that it should just run by itself. I couldn't do another blue ginger because I can't be in two blue gingers at once. But because this is a lower level, and that's okay, you don't have to be fine dining. As a matter of fact, in the US, fine dining is over. No one wants to spend 100 bucks anymore on food and beverage. It's just it's too expensive. In this economy, it's stupid. People want good food, good value, because they can spend 20 bucks and get a great meal. And that's just as good. Uh, you still get the instant gratification and you actually don't risk as much. So, so I'm excited about it. And, and again, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a new thing. Chef, grab that hamachi. Ready? The smoke one? Let's check, let's check it, see what that looks like. All right. So what I'm going to do to plate this up, I'm going to take some of this corn. So the ones that kind of stay together, I'm going to keep together. And it's okay that if it's in pieces. And, and I'm not one, I'm not over fussy. I don't, um, although one of my best meals ever was certainly at El Bui, Fronagia, right? This was in last two Septembers before he closed. 37 course, five and a half hour meal. Perfection, it was unbelievable. Uh, there's nothing I can do. I have no idea. I mean, we have we we make caviar and stuff for desserts and whatnot, but his stuff was absurd. Currently in the states, is a fantastic friend and chef named Grant Atkins. He's in Chicago. If you ever get to Chicago, his restaurant Alinea is is the modern version, if you want, of Ferran Adri. And he worked at, he worked with Ferran. Um, um, point being is that's not how I cook. I, I don't know how to cook that way. It, it's so. Uh, it's so beautiful and so delicious, but I mean, he had a team of 30 cooks doing 40 dinners, right? He does make money because it's, you know, it's that costs, but that was worth every penny. But when I played, it's just, it just has to look good, but it doesn't have to look perfect for me. So, all right, see that smoke a little bit? So you can really smell that, right? So you can tell that this, Hamachi is has been cooked, right? Um, again, it's cured. So what I'm going to do is actually just take. Let me take this one piece here. Over to go. Okay, that's good. So I'm going to take some of this hamachi, 
and I'm going to just take a few slices across the grain. All right, so nice and thin like that, right? Lay a couple pieces out. You know what I was going to say. <laughs> All right, just like that. Just cover the corn. I, you can, I can't really show you, sort of. See that? Woo All right. Then we're going to take... <laughs> Bone. So I take the broken vinaigrette, still warm, right? Warm is fine. Gonna lay a little bit across, and a little bit across here, all right? And take this, again, this is butter with the yuzu. Drizzle that around. So this dish is very rich, right? It's really not that much um, protein, but it's still very rich. And then always a little bit of fresh yuzu on top to kind of brighten it up. All right, so a very, very simple dish. Um, I'll leave it here so you guys can come see it. Now, I love wine. I love wine. And one of the best reasons to be a chef is you get to match, you get to match food with wine. Um, and I love your wine. I've had some fantastic wine here. I've had more white than red. Uh, we're going to Pe no, we're going to, go to, Sh to Seattle tomorrow, then we're going to Pico the next day. Um, and, I, and I've certainly had your pineapple liqueur, your blackberry liqueur, it's all delicious. Um, you get an opportunity when you cook, when you're a chef, to match a good wine. And every wine, we have 225 wines on our list of Blue Ginger, I have tried every single one of them. It won't go on the list unless I tried it. And that's for the sole reasons, when I'm walking through my restaurant, the customer said, hey, do you like the Ravenswood? I have to be able to answer them. I can be like, oh, I hear it's good. That doesn't buy it. If you're the proprietor, if you're the owner, you need to take, you have to take you know, the onus, the responsibility and try it. So uh, this one, obviously, you, you must serve here at the school. Frey Gigante, so that's Big Frey, right? What's a Frey? Is that a person? Is he like Muy Gordo? Muy gordo? <laughs> um, I'll tell you what I think it is. Rodeo, maybe? Is everyone, have you had a wine class here yet? All right, let me show you this. And this is important. When you try wine, you, you spin this, right? On a table. You can spin it in the air if you want, but be careful because you can spill it. And you can spin it on a table. It's easy. Why do we do that? We don't do that to show off. We do that what's called air rate. We're bringing air into the wine. And when you do that, the air comes into the wine and you can then smell it really better. Get your nose into it, right? It's important because how it smells, just like food, really gives you a great idea how it's going to taste. And when you do taste it, you want to suck air over the wine, over your tongue, right? That's not rude. That's smart. Because when you do that, you're adding almost 50% air to the wine so you can really get a good flavor of that wine. Now, you don't have to suck all night long like that, right? And, and, every, and every now and then I do coffee like that. They're like, what are you doing? You know, because you get used to it. Um, but this has great high acid, which I love, because this is an incredibly rich dish. Even though it's not that much food, it's still rich. You know, amberjack comanche is a very rich fish. We have the, the, the bernoisette, which is a very rich, obviously, vinaigrette. So you want a high acidic wine to help cut through the fattiness, the richness of the dish. All right? So I think that's very important. And, and, and you don't have to always believe what the books say, that you have to drink red wine with meat and white wine with fish. What's more important is the actual technique. I can make a piece of tuna taste more deeply flavored than a piece of beef by grilling it and serving it with porcini mushrooms and reducing it down to dark chicken stock. It would be meatier, and I would serve a big red wine with that. And, and the opposite, I could take a piece of pork or something and make it so light that I would serve a really light white wine with it. So the technique that goes to how you prepare the dish is actually more important than the protein itself. All right? Any questions? What is your definition of a good chef? Definition of a good chef? One that stands in front of a cooking school in the Azores. <laughs> no. Um, that's a great question. Um, 
I think, I think a great chef is someone that always is taking a chance to create something new. Now, by the way, no one, including myself, creates a new technique. Everything has been done in this world, right? Barring molecular gastronomy, right? But every combination has been done. I'm not the first person to put hamachi with corn. I'm not the first person to do a bird noise. So all these, all these techniques and combinations have been done. But I think a great chef strives to always make themselves better. And I think the best chefs always continue to teach. Right? Thomas Keller, Girardet, Robuchon, Ducasse, all these guys. Teach, 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 teach. Because by them teaching and spreading what they know, they actually make the world a better place. I always say this, and this is, this is why I'm so honored to be part of the, part of the state chef, um, is if everyone in this world actually were, were happier through food, especially the Middle East right now, and, and spent more time at the dinner table rather than strapping bombs in their body, we'd be a much better place, right? I mean, I, and I say this kind of jokingly, but I say this kind of serious as well. If you knew you were going home to eat Peking duck that your parents were making for you, I'm not sure you'd be pulling that string, right? I think food is the glue of every culture in this world. I mean, obviously I'm Chinese, born in America, but I have Chinese values, right? Parents are the most important thing and grandparents in the world. Education is important, all these values, same in Mexican, same, same in the Azorian culture, I'm sure, same in Spain, same in every culture. But the center glue is always food. Every decision I ever made, a big decision and discussion was at the dinner table. What are my grades? Who am I dating or not dating? Why do you want to do that? Why did you get fired? Why did you get hired? Always happened at the dinner table. And because and, at the dinner table, and it doesn't have to be because of wine, but at the dinner table, people let their guard down in a good way. They open up more. When you're sitting you know, in the White House at a big table, you're not letting your guard down, right? There's, there's those, that side and this side. At a round dinner table, there is no side. And that's, I think, the genius of what's going on right now. And I'm certainly not the only state chef. There's a bunch of us. Um, but, but, it's, but it's a huge honor for me. And, um, and if you take anything away, just remember, you can help change the world through food. Not just feed yourself and feed people, but you can actually help change it. And ultimately, I think that's the goal of all of us. I was not put here just to glide. I know I was put on this world to change the world. Not in a huge way, but in my way. And all of you here have the exact same opportunity to help change the world. And uh, just make sure it tastes good, right? You can only change the world with good food. So. Any other questions out there? I got it. Please. You guys are so great. You stand up. That's awesome. Azorian products? Besides people? Um, I mean, my, again, my favorite is this, right? Pimante de terra. That's, I, I, I think I've... I think I've eaten that every single meal so far. Um, your seafood's amazing. Um, all your cheese, your, the fresca we had with the pineapple chutney, um, and that, that's awesome. Your, the, uh, I, know, I, don't, I don't know if paprika's indigenous to here, but I got to use a bunch of paprika here as well. Um, what else have I had? I've only been here two days, so I feel like I've been here for a week. It's awesome. Um, I'm trying to think what else I've eaten. Oh yeah, I ate, I ate ham and cheese potato chip. You put ham and cheese in a potato chip. I think that's genius. I was eating that. Oh my god, this tastes like a ham and cheese. Um, uh, I, I, there's a lot more in your tea. I think your tea is awesome. Um, and every single glass of wine I've had has been superb as well. And, included, and your beer is special. It's delicious. It's a really good lager. And uh, so, I mean, I've not, put it this way, I've not had anything bad. Uh, all your produce has been amazingly fresh. All your herbs, perfect. Um, and, and your seafood is just, I mean, it's, it's right there. So it's been, it's great. I mean, I, and I knew it would be good here. You're an island, and an island surrounded by seafood. That's already a great start. And uh, so I do, I look forward to a lot more. Chef, can you grab the, the cuisine? So today, I got to, with Chef Pedro, I don't, I think Pedro's at home. He's, he's very tired, as, <laughs> as we all are. But I got to, I saw him make a traditional cuisine, right? Um, Ham, we used what? We used pork belly, pork shank, shanko, right? Um, chicken, pollo. So I did, so he did his version, traditional, uh, and then I did my own version. Um, I put, I did put in paprika, I put in a bunch of savoyas and a bunch of garlic. I put in a little bit of soy sauce. 
I actually put in mandarin, mandarin, your orange, which I love because that's really tart, right? Uh, so again, my food and, and most chefs food is about balance of flavor. So I added four. I washed the skin and just put four halves inside the cozido. And because that's so tart, I then added honey because I wanted to balance out that flavor. So we have a bunch right here. We're going to put it up here. For those that want to come and try it, um, we have some plates. Uh, I encourage you to just try it. It's not, you know, it may not be as good as your dad or mom or your own cozido. I'm not trying to be better, but it's different. And, uh, and I had a ball making it. I mean, to bury something in the ground, um, I, I've never done that before. Um, See this. So, um, so I put so I for me I put in. I'll show you what I put in here. So we had uh, I had the shank. It's going to be hard to grab this. It's so it's amazing how soft this is. So we have pork shank, which I love. We had we used two types of potato. We had chicken as well, which I also love. Um, I did use what's called laurel, right? Laurel leaf, uh, pork uh, bacon, so pork belly as well. I mean, this is like oh, what do you got? This is like the foie gras of the Azores, right? I mean, when you when you braise something like this, like pork belly, uh, it, it's it's better than foie gras, right? It's so delicious. Uh, thank you. What do you got? So a little pork belly, chicken. The shank, oh my god. Did you try this yet? Yes. Is it okay? Uh, Was it good? Delicious, delicious right? <laughs> it was spicy, oh yeah. I put in 12 of the pimante, 12. I put in six onions, so I put in a lot of, much more than maybe traditional. Um, so uh, this, uh, there's the mandarin, right? Your orange. Um, I put in 12 cloves of garlic as well. So I put in a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, and I put in leeks as well. And let me get some sauce here. And you'll see how, how red this sauce got. And this is from the paprika. All right? So if it's $1 a plate, please come up. I'm just kidding. OK. But I, please, I encourage you all, if you want to come up and try this, this is obviously something that uh, inspired by being here, going to going to the market with, in this instance, with Pedro, this dish we did with, with Chef Hugo, um, and, and this is really, again, why I'm a chef. Uh, just in one day, I get to meet people, go to your markets, uh, and your market wasn't even busy yet, right? Saturday's the day, is going to be awesome, but even today, with just a few stuff, oh yeah, and your pineapple, to answer your question, your pineapples are unbelievable. They are so sweet. So we went to the, the plantation right up here. The guy was dressed to the nines, right? He had his hat on, he had his suit on, he, he needed a cigar, it would have been perfect. Um, but he, you know, you talk about smoking, right? You smoke your greenhouse. But oh my God, they were just, they were like nuggets of gold. They were so sweet. I've never had a pineapple as good. Um, and then Joao, who's over here, then he made this amazing cocktail using the pineapple puree. Uh, he called it uh, Two Rivals, two, it was the right, Rival Spirit, thank you, Rival Spirit, because the pineapples from Sao Miguel and the, the, the wine, the fortified wine from uh, Tissier, so the Rival Spirit, and it was really good, freaking delicious. So, anything else? Any other questions? Uh, you were speaking about values before. What's your speaking about what? Values. Values, yeah. Uh, what was it, what's my birth philosophy? No, working philosophy? Working philosophy, okay. My birth philosophy is get born. So <laughs> that worked out. Um, working philosophy, it's a great question. <sighs> Discipline in a kitchen is so important, right? Uh, and I did this, when I first started in the kitchen, I did it all the way through my career. I was first to work and last to leave. Most, most of the time off the clock, right? Because I wanted to impress the chef. I wanted to see the chef, to see me 
there. Not, not just to work hours, but to be doing something. Right? I, I used to be in the hotel business as well. So, you know, I cooked growing up, then I cooked in France, and then I went to Cornell, which is a hotel school, got a master's, so then I tried the hotel business. But my issue with the hotel business, there is who can work the most hours gets promoted. I didn't believe that. It's not the quantity, it's the quality of hours. Um, so I swore to myself that when I became my own chef owner, which is, I'm sure is a lot of your guys' goal, it's the best thing in the world to be your own owner, because when you're the owner, you can't be fired which I love. I've been fired twice because I wasn't the owner. Um, but it's about the quality of work. And even though I was first there and last to leave, I was still doing stuff. I wasn't just there like, you know, on the computer doing nothing. I was actually getting stuff done. Uh, and, and I think one of the most important things in the work environment is not complaining, why is it like this? This is no good. It's solution oriented. If you have an issue at the school, at your job, at your classroom, at your professor. Don't complain about it. Come up with a better solution. So you can say, by the way, I don't think it's great how you do this class, but this is how I think it can be done better. And if it's in the business world, and you can also say, and this will save you money, people will really listen, right? But the point is to be better. May Horsch? Right? No. Is that? May I? God, I gotta spend more time here. Um, because complaining, anyone can do. But coming with solutions, and I tell my team at Blue Ginger all the time, you can complain all you want. Just tell me what the problem is, but please come, me, come to me with three options to make it better. I will listen to that. I'm not gonna listen, I can't believe this doesn't work, I can't believe that doesn't work, or whatever, we need to have more of this or that. State what the issue is, but come with solutions. I think that's absolutely key. Um, and most importantly, I think, and this is beyond work ethic, is just make sure you do what you want to do. Right? I, I studied mechanical engineering in college. Right? I have an ME degree. But while in college, I realized I wanted to be a chef. My dad is the number one foremost graphite designer, composite materials in the world. So the Airbus 380, that's all him. The shuttle, the B-1 bomber, which is why we ended up right at Air Force Base, that's him. So he's a, he's, he is literally a rocket scientist, right? And I'm Chinese, so when you're born Chinese, you're supposed to be three things. Doctor, lawyer, engineer. You're supposed to get any grade you want, as long as they're straight A's. And you're supposed to marry anyone you want, as long as they're Chinese. Well, I'm 0 for 3. I didn't get any of that stuff. But, when I told my parents after coming back from Paris, I got to work with Pierre Hermé, who's still today the best pastry chef in the world. And this is during, um, when, while I was in college, I came back, I sat my parents down, my mom is awesome, they're, they're both awesome, but I said, look guys, thank you for sending me to a great school, I'm going to graduate with a degree, but I want to be a chef. And it wasn't that much of a shocker, because I was already working at my mom's Chinese restaurant, so they knew I loved it. My mom, of course, gives me a big hug and says, you're so lucky, at your young age, you already know what you want. You have your passion, follow it, just promise to work 110%. I'm like, not a problem. I look at my dad, who's much more pensive and quiet, and he goes, son, you weren't going to be a very good engineer anyway. Go cook. I'm like, wow. But he's right, because I didn't really have a passion for engineering, so I'm not going to, I wouldn't fly in a plane I designed, for example, right? That wasn't my love. My love was this, making people happy. So I think it's really important to, to follow that. To answer your other question, East, West, Chinese, American, um, I think uh, I believe in the priorities of Chinese culture, so respect to the elders and education and family, 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 and food, food, food. Uh, I'm very Americanized. I was born in Newport Beach, California, right? And so I was like, I get it. But, um, uh, but my philosophy is more Taoist than anything. I'm not very religious. I mean, I know there's a God. She is very powerful. That I know. Um, but I'm really more of a Taoist, which is basically go with the flow. Right? You have water that goes this way. You can't go that way. I don't care who you are. You might can go left and right. You can this way, but you cannot fight it. So whatever, whatever comes up in life, you, just, you have to go with it. And, and I think, again, I think if everyone did that and just ate better food, we'd be better off. So, good question. Thank you. Anything else? Do you consider yourself a role model in the cooking arts? Hmm. 
Um, I don't know, do you? No, you don't know, oh wow. Um, I, I think I am for younger cooks. I mean, I've been cooking 25 years, so I'm pretty good, right? Um, uh, I know I'm a role model for my children. That I can say for sure. Uh, and I know for the guys that have been with me, I, we're 14 years old. My, my executive chef's been with me 13 years. I have two chefs, two sous chefs have been with me 12 years. My, one of my general managers has been with me nine years. So at least I can tell myself if I was horrible, they wouldn't stick around because I don't, it's not like I pay them more than anyone else. I pay them normal, right? Although I do take care of them, which is another one of my philosophies, is you have to take care of the people that are around you. No one works for me. Everyone works with me. And that's how I think. I never give an order. I say, will you, do you have time, please? And after that, I say, thank you. Don't ever give orders. That's, if you give orders, you're insecure. That means you've got this chip on your shoulder and you've got to do this. No, that's baloney. Do you have time to do this? Right? That's really important. And one thing I learned in France is you say hello to everyone when you get to work and you say goodbye, thank you to everyone when you leave work. And here we just, we just blow it up with the fist because everyone's hands, you don't want to shake everyone's hand now because you know, they're cooking and you don't want their hands dirty. So, but every single person I say hello and goodbye, especially the dishwashers. They're the most important people in your restaurant. Take care of them. Because I've, I've learned the hard way. When you don't have dishwashers, I'm in there, and that's the hardest job in the world. I don't care who you are, what you are. Nine, 10, 12 hours washing dishes, that is brutal. So you have to make sure the people around you take care. Because they're the ones going to help you rise to the top. But if you don't take care of them, they're going to laugh at you when you fall down. And uh, so I hope that, hope that answers your question. Um, but you guys have great questions. Anything else? Gotta be cocktail time soon. No? All right, listen. Muito obrigado. Thank you all very much. Please come up and try this if you want. And, you can, and I can slice you some homachi as well. Um, and I don't know. I'll, I, I will, I have, if you ever come to Boston, my restaurant's called Blue Ginger, and then we have a lot of Portuguese right in Boston, right? That's fantastic. We have, we have a restaurant called the Azorian actually, in, in northern Boston, which I've not been to, to be honest, I just come here instead. Um, but if you come to Boston, um, please stop by Blue Ginger, I'd love, love to see you. I always take interns, we take eight to 10 a year, right, we have two at a time. Most of them are CIA Johnson & Wales, I know you're affiliated with Johnson & Wales, and if you are interested, just write a really good cover letter, say we met here, um, and you know, we get a lot, so we can only take two at a time, um, but you know, you never know. It'd be great to have you guys there, but thank you all very much. Muito obrigado. piece of hamachi if you want. Oh, it's spicy, yeah. That cozido is spicy. But just use your fingers, please. Just help yourself.
Okay, I better go. Okay, all good. One more. One more. Okay. Yeah. He has shame. What's his shame? How are you? Okay. Yeah. All right, one time, let's go. <laughs> no. She needs to do one. Okay. Nice. Thank you, sir. At tres tiempo. Okay. 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 Okay.